To begin building the Korox from Zelda, all I'm going to do is rough out the body shape using clay. And at this point, I don't really care how smooth it is, I'm just blocking in each of the limbs and components of the main body. Because I'm primarily a 2D artist, I found it really helpful to do some sketches of the direction that I wanted my Korox to go so that when I was sculpting, I didn't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what shape I wanted to make, I already knew. One of the things you have to watch out for in clay is how thick your piece is. So I used lots of tools to pierce the clay, to either make holes for the airflow for the kiln, or also so that they can hold uh, flowers later on. Next is making the face. I just used a roller to make a small uh, flat piece of clay. And again, at this point, I don't really care how smooth it is because I'm gonna smooth it out later. So now I'm going to score the body of the Korok and just use a sharp tool to slice into it and then a little bit of water to help it stick. If you don't do this well enough, then there's a chance it could come apart in the kiln and that would just be sad for everybody. So make sure to attach those properly and use a wet brush to smooth out the clay. Um, I mean, that's just a style choice but I like the smooth kind of feeling, so I always use a wet brush to round everything out. And I think that the wooden skewer was really helpful to sculpt on as well. After sculpting each batch of different Koroks, uh, it took about a week for them to dry before you can fire them in the kiln. Luckily, I live in Arizona, so it's really dry climate out here, and uh, just did a couple kiln loads, they're very fragile before firing, but afterwards they're a little bit uh, less delicate. So at this point, it's been about four weeks for me to make all of these clay Koroks and also allow them time to dry uh, so that they can be fired. I was so worried that somebody might crack or explode, and luckily we had no problems at all. Next up is glazing. And glazing is kind of weird for clay because the colors don't look like how they will look until after it's fired. You have to do a couple coats of each color for it to be its full strength. So you're supposed to let it dry between coats, and so I just started with the bodies first, painted a flat color for their leaf. After the face and the body was dry, then I would start to add my um, black face details, and these were pretty challenging just because they were so recessed in the leaf and I did not want any of the black to seep out into that green. And if that wasn't hard enough, I decided to paint the stripes on the leaf. And I don't think it would be that bad if you only had to do one coat, but you have to do two or three depending on how dark or how opaque you want the color to come out. So. You have to go over the lines two or three times, and it's just hard to keep it all clean. But I had to add this touch to the Korox because I think it really helps enhance their personality. The majority of the glazes that we used were stroke and coat, but from what I understand, most glazes take on this pastel appearance before firing and after firing, the colors and brand that we chose will be much more glossy. So I am just a plebeian in the 3D world. I'm not a professional clay artist or anything like that, but my mom is, and so she was able to give me a lot of tips and help me through this process. When you're firing the ceramics with glaze on them, they have to be up off of the floor of the kiln, so we were only able to cook so many at a time. It took three kiln loads to fire them all, with one of them having a top shelf. Here's my mom loading them up into the kiln, and that's what they look like before and after, so they have a much more glossy finish. And the clay that I chose to make them with is called Speckled Buff. 
it actually has a dotted kind of natural appearance to it. So wherever the stripes on their body are is really smooth and glossy. And wherever the bare clay is has that more textured rough look to it. So now I'm going to start uh, with all the different components. I picked up some of these wooden boxes actually at the dollar store, um, but I didn't like the finish of the wood, so I just used some burnt umber and raw sienna acrylic paint to paint them. And I wanted them to sit up a little bit. I didn't want to fill the boxes completely with moss, so I put some of that like crinkle cut Easter paper in the bottom there just to rise them up a little bit. And a couple of the Koroks came out bigger than I was thinking, so I got some of these larger boxes and they actually look like little suitcases, which is really fun. I wanted to make almost like a nest for them to sit in. Um, one, because it will protect them since I'm going to be bringing them to a comic convention. I need them to be protected so that they don't break or chip or anything. But also it gave me the opportunity to further aesthetically complement the Koroks. In the Zelda games, they are holding little branches with berries on them and they wave them around and they're super cute. But when I was making these branches with the berries, they just didn't seem exciting enough, so I got some of these glass flower beads. And although they weren't originally what I had in mind, I do think that they came together very nicely. They were difficult to do, um, but it's basically just a piece of wire and a little bit of hot glue and some hemp string. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I have no fingertips left after gluing all of these. I burned myself so much, but it was worth it. And while I did it, I wanted to make sure that the leaves could still move around. I don't know why, I just thought that that was super cute. So each of these little guys has a different flower. Um, some have a hole in each hand, so they actually have two flowers. And if somebody wanted to, they could definitely take this off. Um, but I kind of crimped it on there, just so it wouldn't fall out and get lost. So I just did this uh, for each of them. Everybody got at least one flower. And by the end of assembling all these flowers, uh, we started to get really creative, like stacking so many flowers on top of each other and making all sorts of different bouquets and stuff. And while I was making these flowers, I just kind of looked at the personality of the Korok and thought about what I want its nest to look like. And I kind of built the rest of the elements in the nest off of the flower color and the personality that matches our little forest friends here. It was really important to me that each one had its own individual personality and that they were all unique in their own way, so I definitely leaned into trying out different colors and configurations. The other element that I wanted the Koroks to have were the pinwheels that are featured in the game, and so I used antique newspaper and sheet music and with a little bit of luck and some pH neutral glue, I was able to fold these on top of little toothpicks. So this was the part I was so excited about from the start, and it's going to be to finally assemble our Korok nests. Essentially, I just made sure that each of them had one of the Korok seeds, that they give you for finding them in the game, so everybody gets one. And uh, I basically just assembled these with some different pom-poms. There are some clear butterfly stickers that I cut the edges off of and folded and placed into the boxes, along with some little mushrooms and definitely uh, fake foliage as well. I wanted to make sure that it will basically always look the same if somebody gets it, so I didn't want to put anything that was alive inside the box. I thoroughly enjoyed making these Koroks, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching the process. Like I said earlier, I'll be bringing these to a comic convention next month, 
However, any that don't sell, I will be listing on my online shop on Etsy. Please enjoy the music and the final glamour shots, and have a wonderful week, guys. Thanks for watching my video. Thank you.